Okay, so we're going to dig into tail recursion here. To get started, I'm going to work with the factorial function. And I'm going to use test-driven development. So before I write my factorial function, I'm going to write some tests. So I can say check. And I want to call it fact. And fact of 1 should give me 1. Make a few copies of that. Fact of 2 should give me 2. Okay, I've got my tests. They're actually going to really fail right now because I haven't even defined fact. So we check out fact undefined variables. So I'll actually say define fact of x, which is return 0. And now I can see that all of my tests fail. 0 passed. Okay, now I'm ready to write this. I can start with my base case and say, you know, if someone wants to know the fact of 1, so if x is 1, then I'm going to return 1. Otherwise, I'm going to make a recursive call and do times x of fact and x minus 1. It's important to note here that if x is 0 or anything smaller, this is going to really screw it up. So I'll make a note here that x should be greater than 1, greater than 0. Okay, let's run this test. Oh, I misspelled fact there. And all five tests passed. So I'm including the library racket trace so that I can call trace and pass it the function fact. So as a side note, trace is a higher order function because it takes in the function fact. And what it does is anytime fact gets called, it'll tell me what arguments it gets called with. So if I say fact of five, it shows me all the steps. So fac of 5, that's just a repeat of what got called. It's called fac of 4, called fac of 3, called fac of 2, called fac of 1. Fac of 1 returned 1, fac of 2 returned 2, fac of 2 returned to fac of 3, which gave it, which returned 6. And we can think of each of these calls to factorial as a separate function call. And each one had to wait for the one after it to complete. So you can see how the arrow sort of go out and then back in. So this pattern where fac of 5 needed to wait for the answer from fac of 4 and then do a little bit more calculation. In this case, it took the answer from fac of 4 and multiplied 5 by it. That's called embedded recursion. Let's look at the code. So in the code, after the fac function returned, after the recursive call returned, I still needed to multiply by x. So whenever there's some calculation happening after my recursive call happens, or here on the outside of my recursive call, that's embedded recursion. So this is exactly what makes this embedded recursion. So I want to rewrite this function using tail recursion, which will mean just that it's not embedded recursion. I've already written tests for fact t, which will be my tail recursive version. And you can see that it has the exact same behavior as fact. Okay, we don't have to be quite sure what to put in there yet. I'm going to write a helper function for this tail recursive function, fact t. It will also take in a number. I'll call that number z. And it'll keep track of the answer so far. From my original function, from fact t, I'll call this helper, fact t helper. Instead of z, I'll pass the value n. And my answer to start off with will just be 1, because at that point I haven't multiplied anything together. Imagine, here in my test case, when someone calls fact t of 1, I'll pass 1 for n, which will mean z is 1, and answer so far will be 1, because that's what I've passed here. In that case, I want to return 1, so I can just return the answer so far. So, if... Okay, even now... I'll add a few more close parens, and this is going to work for my first test case. Now what I want to do is I want to make a recursive call to fact t helper, and I want to update both z and answer so far. z, I'm going to subtract 1, and answer so far, I'm going to multiply it by the current value of z. I'll load the file. Oops, I have an extra definition of fact t here. I'll delete that. I'll load the file. 
Oh, I have another error, x, unbound identifier and module. I have a typo here. Here I mean to use the variable z. All 10 tests pass, but let's look at how it actually happened. To do that, I'll trace fact t helper. Now when I call fact t of 6, let's see what happens. That called fact t helper of 6 and 1. Then we multiplied the 6 and the 1 to get this new answer so far. Then again, fact t helper of 5 and 6 called fact t helper with 4, so that's z minus 1, and multiplied my old value of z and my answer so far. And each time it's keeping up to date this answer so far. And that should get us the exact same answer as if we type fact of 6. Yep. But here, each function was having to wait for the previous one to finish. And it was literally sitting around in memory waiting for that other calculation to happen. Here, you'll see there's no nesting. Right when fact t helper 1 returns, it just returns answer so far. And we know the whole answer. There's nothing, if we look at the code, there's nothing waiting here in this calculation. Once fact t helper returns, there's nothing else to do. That's what makes this tail recursion. You'll notice that I have the original function that you'd call like fact t, and then I have this helper function. That's a really common pattern with tail recursion because we often need to keep track of an answer like answer so far where we want to keep track of an extra argument. And we don't want someone who's calling our function to necessarily need to know about that extra argument. So that's why we have this function that someone would actually call, and we call our internal function fact t helper. Again, it was a little bit complicated to restructure our code this way, but the whole goal was to make sure that once this recursive call returned, there were no other calculations to be done. And that's really what defines tail recursion. I hope that helps.